All right, so I'll get started. Uh, welcome to Computer Science 3200. Uh, my name is Dave Churchill, obviously in computer science. Sorry about the hike that you had to perform to get over here. This is my first time actually teaching in the education building, so it's a bit of a, um, a walk. I do know now, I timed it, so it's less than half the time if you go outside than through the tunnels, because you gotta like go up and down and stuff in here. It's weird, education building. But I requested a room with lecture capture, so here we are. Um, so what I'm gonna do is, who, who's joined the Discord so far? Okay, so just, I'm just curious. It's not, it's not necessary or required. I'll go over all of that. Um, so just for everyone who may have just walked in, just to let you know, so I have requested lecture capture be done for the class. So there's two separate video feeds being recorded and hopefully with my audio. So one is coming from the camera back there, uh, which may record like the back of some people's heads but it's just, it's just back there, it's recording me, but I don't really need that, that video feed, so if possible, I will hide that one and just post the other one, which is just the slides. Now, the way that I teach is I'll point with a laser pointer, like at something, if it's important. I tried to do it with like the, the on-screen laser pointer, but it's weird, like if I'm facing this way, it's actually, it's a weird direction. So, if you're watching the lectures, you probably won't have the laser pointer. That, so it's, it's a little bit disorienting sometimes, but whatever, we'll, we'll do what we can. So most of you have probably read um, the D2L post, but I will go over that because I found some typos in my, uh, in my uh, morning class. So we'll go over this, and then we'll go over the syllabus and the spreadsheet and give all the class info, and then like a brief introduction to what we'll be talking about in the course, what is AI. Etc. cetera. Um, at any point, feel free to put your hand up, and when I'm finished the slide, I'll, I'll call on you for a question. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just read this through and see if we have any typos. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Comp 3200, Algorithmic Techniques for Artificial Intelligence. That's a really long way of just basically saying intro to AI. Um, that's how I view it as anyway. Um, our course this term will be in-person lecturing with in-person exams, so there will be a midterm and a final, and here is all the info you need to know about the course. So we have Tuesdays and Thursdays from 2 to 3.15 in this room, so most of you have made it. There are 72 people registered for the course. There are definitely not 72 people here, but I don't, I don't expect um, everyone to show up, and I suspect I'll never see half of you again if the lecture capture works properly, so nice to meet you. Um, it's in this room, and it's on, this is the first day. There is a course schedule spreadsheet that I'll go over in a little bit, but first let's get into the general course information. So generally when I teach, I make use of D2L, so obviously you all know what that is. Um, my website contains links to a bunch of different information, so you can go there if you want, but that's not necessary. And I have a Discord server, which a number of you have already joined, which is completely optional, uh, but there is a lot of discussion that goes on there if you want to ask a question, um, like PMing me on Discord is, is probably the fastest way to do it. Um, I can't promise I'll see it immediately, but I'll see that at least as fast as I see a, um, an email. Yep? Yeah, but I tried joining the Discord, but the link has expired. Okay, uh, a bunch of people joined today. Um, so yeah, I, the link should not expire, <laughs> but if it did, if anyone else finds it, just Post a I was going to say post a message on Discord, but that's just email me and I'll put up a new link. Um, try not to send the, the link around publicly. I want it to be just for students. Um, I know there's all sorts of people really wanting to join academic Discord servers, but just try and keep it, keeps it free of spam and stuff like that as well. Um, all the course content will be linked on a Google spreadsheet. So again, you don't have to use that, but it's, it's how I organize things and I'll show you that in a bit. Um, and the link to the spreadsheet and the course syllabus and everything can be found on my website if you want to uh, use it that way. All the important course announcements will be made on D2L, so if there is a Discord announcement, that will also be made on D2L. So if you're not on Discord, you won't miss anything, um, except the conversations that happen there. Sometimes a student will post, hey, when's the midterm again, or hey, like, I, I had trouble with this algorithm, what's, you know, what am I getting wrong, that sort of thing. Um, so there's a public chat room there. If you do join the Discord uh, server, um, something that I put there was that you just have to choose which courses that you're taking. 
And you can read the entire Discord without choosing a role, but in order to post to the, to the 3200 channel, you have to have clicked that you are taking 3200. It's just like the, the smallest bit of, of security on the server. And just to let you know, um, Discord is a privately owned company. It has nothing to do with the university. I am not in control of the privacy settings of Discord, et cetera. They could be selling your information. I don't know, right? Just assume that nothing you say on my Discord server is private because anyone could be there, anyone could be watching, technically. So that's the, the sort of privacy spiel about Discord. Use it if you want. If not, no big deal, you'll get by fine. So in this class, um, typically when an assignment is released in a course, you'll just get like get the assignment or a piece of paper or a zip file or whatever. Um, I do things a little bit differently. Um, so all students in the class will be emailed a link probably next week to your at mun.ca address containing um, a URL where you can personally download your copy of the assignment. And I'll get into that in just a little bit and why that is. But you will get a link, it'll have, or you'll get an email, it will have five links, and throughout the term when the assignment is released, those five links will be the five different assignments. Uh, when you're finished the assignment, you can submit it via D2L. All of the, the assignment due dates and drop boxes and stuff are already up there. Um, you're going to submit a, it's not a zip file actually, you're going to just be submitting a single file. So this is a typo. So the class is going to be, we're going to be using JavaScript for the algorithms. Um, don't worry if you have no JavaScript knowledge. It's, the language is kind of a, like a side effect. It doesn't really matter. I'll, you'll, we'll get into that when we get into the assignments. But you'll just submit a single JavaScript file um, that I've given you to fill out, and only the last submission is kept. Okay? I don't see 50 submissions if you submit 50 times. So if you're like getting close to the deadline and you're not sure if you'll make it, submit whatever you have, and then when you're finished, submit it again. Okay? So I only see the last one. Um, so, unfortunately, in every class, there are some people who try and, you know, take shortcuts. And so, due to the rise in both cheating and assignment sharing, and by assignment sharing, I mean posting it on Chegg or all these other websites that I regularly monitor, um, the reason I give out, I email you each an assignment is that in those assignment, each assignment contains a few different files. Each of those files is going to have in plain text, metadata, and hidden all of your student information. So your name, your student number, um, it's going to be there. So if you post those files online, I will know where they came from. Um, it is obviously not impossible to circumvent that, but it would be easier to do the assignment than to circumvent that. Okay, so try not to post your stuff online. It would be, that'll be very bad. You, do, you don't want to, to cheat um, in this class. The assignments really aren't that difficult, so I don't know why you would, but yeah, don't, don't cheat and don't post them online. Uh, if, because assignments in this class are done in up to, uh, groups of up to two people, so you can have a partner for the assignments, um, you're totally free to share the code with your partner, obviously, um, but if you end up using something like GitHub or some other um, SVN or whatever um, versioning system you're going to use, just make that repo private, okay? And after the first assignment's released, like a month into the course, I just go on uh, GitHub and I search for uh, Comp3200, and I'm not out to like get you expelled or anything. It's just a reminder if I see it public, hey, make sure that this is private um, because I can't have the assignment um, solutions going everywhere. Uh, so that is how the assignments are going to work. You submit it on D2L, the due dates are there, and uh, don't post them online. Um, yeah, posting, posting publicly online, um, it's basically a zero in the course, okay? Like, it's, it's really bad if you do that. It's not. There are reasons for a lot of things in life, right? Like, if you need extra time on your assignment, ask anyone who's done courses with me before. If you get sick, if there's a family thing, you need an extra day or two, I'm more than happy to comply with that. So there, there are always excuses to need an extra bit of time, but there's never an excuse to, to cheat. Right? So plagiarizing off someone else's assignment, using ChatGPT, um, Copilot, all those kind of things. Um, I have a lot of experience with those things. I can usually tell when someone has used them. Um, can't tell 100% for sure, right? unless you submit like a video of you using it. But in the class, I teach the algorithms in a very specific way. 
And for every single assignment, basically all you have to do is take the slide where I've given you the pseudocode, copy it into JavaScript, and then change the pseudocode to be actual JavaScript. And so if what ends up in your assignment is like the algorithm that I know is on Wikipedia or on Red Guides or like what, you know, all these other websites that list these algorithms, um, I know that you know, you've taken them from somewhere else because it's a very specific way that it's taught here. So just, it really is the easiest way. Um, I'm more upset by the fact that people think Wikipedia is easier than my notes than I am about the actual cheating. So maybe I should, I, I don't know. But anyway, don't use ChatGPT. Some people are allowing it in their courses. I'm not. Um, it really will just sell yourself short. Uh, when it comes to the exams, if you don't know it, you don't know it, right? Um, I think there's like one or two parts of a couple of the assignments that I've, I, I've put everything that I've ever done into ChatGPT just to test it. A couple of the assignments can be partially solved. The way that I have set it up is such that it's, like there's an infrastructure that you need to incorporate your code into, and so that makes it a little more difficult for, for things like this to solve it. But, I mean, typically, you want to be really good at what you do, right? And study it, and this is your chance to learn it before you're thrown into a job where there's no second chances, right? So, so try and learn it. I think, I think you'll actually have a bit of fun doing it. And I know that people always roll their eyes at all this, oh, I'm not going to cheat, but there's always, there's just a couple of people, so I have to say it, and this is like, the one and final warning that cheating is just, it's a zero in the course, and then you can go argue with the university about it, because I'm not, no cheating. All right. Uh, I think I already um, mentioned this, so there was a link to the Discord. I'm not sure if this one is still active. Has anyone joined it today successfully? Yeah, yeah a few people, okay. Yeah, just now. Yeah, just now I oh, perfect, okay. I'm probably gonna replace the link because I have now recorded something that I said not to post publicly, right? It's gonna be in the, the lecture slides. Um, so don't, don't share that publicly. And if you can, uh, if you're sending me a DM, you know, I, I get like, you know, new DM from Blazeit420. And just, just put your name there, like first name, last initial, something that I know who I'm talking to, right? So I, can, so I can get to know you a little bit. You'd be surprised at like the Discord avatars and stuff, it's, it's really funny. So the delivery information, uh, I already said some of this. I'm going to be using the in-class or the lecture capture system. Uh, so I hope I see you again. I don't know how well it works yet because this is my first time using it. Hopefully I'm going to be able to download and edit those lectures a little bit and then post them in a, in a nicer way. And hopefully the quality is something that I'm used to for my, my past courses. Uh, all the lecture videos will be posted to D2L and also possibly uh, if I'm not breaking any university rules, to post it to a YouTube playlist, because what I like to do is put chapters in the videos so you can go right to the exact algorithm when you're studying, and also so if someone has a question, I can just show them the timestamp of the video, and that functionality isn't in D2L as far as I know. Um, so just keep in mind that uh, I'm not going to be posting like the video, so no one will be in any of that video, it's just the, um, just the, the lecture slides. Also, it is not necessary, uh, feel free to if you want, but it's not necessary to take notes in my classes. I post the PDFs, so everything you see on the screen I will post, so you'll have the lecture slides to study from. If you feel like you learn by writing down, that's fine, but what I suggest, at least for my classes, is to show up, pay attention to what I'm saying, ask questions if you have them, and then later you just have the notes, okay? Now, just keep in mind that anywhere, it's not, not very frequent that I have animations or videos in the slides, but the videos that are in the slides, you'll just get a PDF, so it'll be a picture, but that won't be a huge deal. So you'll get the static PDF slides, not the animated um, PowerPoint slides, but it's still fine to study from. Uh, unless there is some sort of crazy emergency, um, I will not be missing any lectures in the course. So if we're sent home from, I don't know, some new version of COVID or if there's a snow day or whatever, what I'm going to do is I'll record the lecture at home and I'll post it. So we'll, we'll get all the content in. And that's just because that's happened in the past and like when Snowmageddon happened a few years ago, like we missed like four lectures, I had to cut out a whole section. And so I'll just be, I'll post it online and I'll post a D2L if that ends up happening. Um, and just to let you know, so I'm not, I, my YouTube channel isn't monetized, I'm not trying to get like subs or anything, but 
I do have um, previous offering of the course on YouTube. The lectures are there. You are free to watch those lectures if you want. However, the caveat of that is that things change every year. Assignments may have different things in them. Um, lectures may have updated information. And so do not rely on those videos because things very often change. I update it as new technologies come out. It's going to be about 90% the same, right? So you can watch those videos if you want to, but just keep in mind that anything I say in this class this year is what the truth is, right? So when it comes to exams or assignment info, anything like that, it's, it's these lectures that you have to pay attention to. You can't come to me and say, oh, well, you said this in your YouTube video, right, from last year, because that's last year. So I, I just mention it there because they're, they're high quality. You can use them as study guides. You can watch them on double speed or whatever you want. They're there if you want. The goal, I, I know that some profs don't like posting lectures because then people stop coming to class. Hopefully you keep coming to class. I know like I was a student for a long time. Um, coming to a physical room to stand in front of somebody is like annoying, right? I get it. Some people have jobs and other classes and stuff. So it's there. My goal is to teach you not to lock you into like a classroom, right? So it's there if you want. Hopefully I can post these lectures. I'll know probably by tomorrow if what the quality is like. But try to keep coming to class and, you know, and keeping up with the lectures. So this class will have in-person midterm and finals. And I will be giving details of those in a future lecture. So the midterm will be in this room. And the final will, will be wherever I am given a room by the university. I do not schedule the time or the room of the final. The university does that. So once I have that information, I'll post it uh, to D2L. Any questions so far? So that's a good question. Um, if you are working in a group of two, submit one assignment, and at the top, there will be a place to write both of your names. Okay? So only submit one. Um, it, if you both submit, we're not going to take off marks, but please don't do that because it's just more work to sort those things out. Um, if you end up using GitHub for whatever reason to share your code, that's not how you submit the assignments. You submit the assignments on D2L, one file, and then in that file, both names are, are on the file up at the top. So there'll be a big comment. Do you want us to like, document our contributions? Or just... it's, I'm going to assume that you both did an equal amount of work unless said otherwise. Sure. Okay? So, yeah. Uh, who is going to submit? Doesn't matter. Both your names are there. I mark, or we mark the one assignment and then give the grade to both of you. Yeah. So we're not using the groups feature or anything like that. I'm just taking your word that that both of you did it. You know, if one person was sick and one person did it all, I had one, I had one group come up to me and say, yeah, we took turns doing the assignment this year. I was like, well, good for you for telling me, but like, that's not what I recommend, right? The assignment was, uh, they're designed to be enough work for two people, right? But remember, if you do get carried through an assignment, that's just going to come back, like I'm going to have assignment-like questions on the exam, right? So that'll come back and bite you on the exam if that happens. Okay, so this is the class spreadsheet. Um, it shows the whole course planned out. As I do the lectures, they will be posted here. So to D2L, possibly to YouTube. Um, and at first, at least, I'm going to make the, the YouTube videos unlisted. So they're not publicly viewable to see how that goes. But the link to it will be there, so you can, you can look at it through the link. And the PDF slides for the lecture will be posted here as well. And all of these links go back to D2L. So this is not something, this is just like an organizational sheet where you can kind of see the whole class um, at a glance, but the same data is there on D2L. So if you go to the class materials on D2L, you'll just see a list without the dates, okay? So that's how that works. Um, and once I know the date of the final, I will, I will post it down here. Uh, I don't know that yet, so I'm going to delete that, because it's certainly not in April of this year. OK, uh, and again, so my website is here. Uh, my office hours are going to be 
basically Tuesday after class till five. Um, so I'll, I'll go back to my office and just officially starting at 4 p.m., but whenever I get back to my office till five on Tuesdays is when my office hours are gonna be. So if you have any questions, and if I look at the sheet here, most of the assignments, except for the last one, are due on Tuesday. So I expect those are the Tuesdays when I'm gonna have a lot of visitors at my office. Um, oh, the other sort of not, not hard and fast rule, but a guideline that I use for my classes. As I said before, if you come to me and you're, you're sick or whatever, you need an extra day, that's usually not a problem. But my rule is, if you ask me on the due date, it's a no, unless it's some sort of emergency, right? So the thing is, you have to have at least tried and done something, and if you know in advance, okay, I'm gonna need a little bit of extra time for this valid reason, I will do it. But if you come to me 11.49 p.m. on the due date, 10 minutes before it's due, and you can't show me that anything has been done, you're not, you're not getting an extension. It's not like to take advantage of it. It's come to me a couple of days in advance, um, and, or a day in advance at least, and, and we'll see about that. You just have to have tried first. That's all that I ask. Uh, what else is there? Oh yeah, syllabus. So on D2, this is posted on D2L. I just find it a lot easier to read here. Uh, in PowerPoint. So I, I don't need to read the course objectives. Course outline. So the subjects in the course are kind of broken down by topic, by assignment. So the lecture today is sort of what is AI, and then we'll be getting into um, the first couple of lectures of the course are really like definition heavy because we need to know a bunch of things before we use those things. And so like the next lecture is probably the most information dense lecture of the whole term, but it's you need to know uh, what all these things are. Then the actual algorithms we'll be talking about. Uh, we'll be implementing algorithms from the ground up. So this is not a deep learning course. Um, you won't be using any libraries for machine learning or neural nets or anything like that. There's a machine learning course if you, if you want to do machine learning. This is more of a broad overview of an intro to several different topics within AI. Believe it or not, AI is not just machine learning, despite what all these companies will have you believe. It's been around since literally the 1950s, and only the past decade really has, has machine learning really taken off um, in its usefulness. So about the first half of the course is going to focus on something called search algorithms. So um, there's a bunch of different topics here. So single agent search, like things like how might I solve a Sudoku puzzle or solve a maze using a search algorithm. Uh, then we'll go into um, uh, multiplayer search. So for example, if you have a game like checkers or chess, how would you write an algorithm to, to create the strongest AI for one of those? Um, and we'll talk about some data structures and optimizations for those search algorithms that'll speed them up and make them use less memory, et cetera. Then um, we will talk about uh, evolutionary computation and genetic algorithms. Um, they'll actually be like, it's only like one or two lectures, but we do an assignment on it. Genetic algorithms are pretty cool, but they're also pretty quick and, and easy to teach. Then um, we will talk about reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning will be uh, about the last third of the course, and it's a type of machine learning that learns by experience with the environment. So we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to it, but this is sort of a topic list on, on what we'll be talking about. And then at the very end, we'll talk a little bit about neural networks how they work from the ground up, but it will be on the exam, but there won't be an assignment on it. So implementing a complete neural network from scratch is, is a little bit out of scope for the course, but one of the lectures will actually be um, about the, like how you would create a neural net from scratch if you wanted to. So that's the topic list. Um, there are two recommended but not required textbooks for the course. The first half of the course uses a lot of terminology from this, Russell and Norvig um, uh, book up here. I typically don't want students to have to spend like hundreds of dollars on textbooks. And I, I still maintain that you can do all of the assignments and all of the exams with just the lecture materials and the slides. So if you want, this, the second half of the course on reinforcement learning, this second book, that's the best textbook I've ever read. Um, it's really, really well done. It's plain English, and of course, there's some algorithms in there as well, but it's really well explained, and so if you're having any trouble at all with the reinforcement learning section, 
you can read the appropriate chapters from that textbook. But I'm not the type of person who says, OK, go read 10 chapters for homework, and we'll talk about it next time. I, there's enough work in this course without having to do that. So yeah. Um, the evaluation, five assignments, 50% total. They are not 10% each. Assignment two is probably the most work, and so assignment two is worth more than the others. Um, with each assignment, I will give a detailed marking scheme, like how you lose every percent in the assignment, so that by the time you submit your assignment, you'll know if you got an 80 or above, because you've hit all of those, all of those uh, marks. There will be a midterm exam in here, uh, covering everything up to the midterm exam, and then there will be a final exam somewhere that will cover the entire course, but about two-thirds focused on the final half of the course. So there'll be some things in there from the first half, but not everything else. Um, I already talked about this, but I just, please don't cheat. It just, it doesn't work out well for anybody. And I know, like, don't be nervous. Like, you know, if you submit something that could have been written by something, like, I'd have to have solid proof of, of actually any sort of um, penalties for submitting something. And that's kind of hard to do these days. But I will tell you that, like, so I'm sure there are probably a few people in this classroom where English is not their first language, right? And so if whatever your first language may be, if you hear someone else speak that language who isn't a native speaker of that language, you can hear an accent, right? You can immediately say, OK, that person learned that language, just like someone who speaks English can usually tell that someone else has an accent. Believe it or not, I've been doing this for so long, your code has an accent. And if it's written from my notes, I'll know that you're writing this native code, right? And if it's not, I'll know that it's from somewhere else. However, that being said, the assignments are usually do this standard thing to get like 90% or 95%, whatever it is for the assignment. And then the last 10% is this like sort of tricky, not bonus, but like the, the cherry on top, right? And if, when I give the assignment, I say that you can use whatever source you want for that bonus part, then you can do it, okay? Like, for example, hey, once you've gotten this algorithm working, maybe there's like an optimization that you could do that would make it run faster so you'll do better in the in-class competition that we're gonna have for assignment three. That part, you could, you could use other sources. I still don't want you to use automatic code generation, but all I ask is that for those parts, if you do see it on Stack Overflow or like chessprogramming.com is an amazing resource, just, just cite it. Hey, I got this idea from here. That's all you'll ever have to do, okay? Um, oh yeah, and the last thing is, the, some of the assignments come with solution code that has been run through an obfuscator. So if you look at it without doing anything to it, it just looks like garbage, right? It's like ones and zeros almost. The reason that I give you that is so that you can test your assignment against the solution to see what it should look like, right? To say, okay, here's the answer, here's what you got. So like on assignment one and two, you're gonna be able to hit a button and know if your solution is correct. So that's like a good faith thing from me to like let you see that. Um, I have had students try and like reverse engineer that and it's just really not worth it. Uh, it's not worth it for several reasons. One, it's infinitely harder to do that than it is to do the assignment. <laughs> like it's just way harder to do that. Second, the code that I wrote to solve the assignment is like an optimized version of a thing that I am not teaching you. So if I see that, then we'll have a chat. Right, because I've done it in a very specific way that is not available easily online, and someone handed it in once, and I was like, "Hey, how did you do that?" And they're like, "I don't know." I'm like, "Okay, well, that's a zero on the on the assignment, right?" And then someone else handed in my solution as their solution, and it was still obfuscated. <laughs> it was still the garbage code that like didn't have code. It was just my, and I was like, "That's just odd." Anyway. Oh, and someone else got someone um, that they knew from their home country to do the assignment for them and did it in a completely different way. And when I asked them about it, they had no idea what was going on. So just don't do any of that, 
It's, and even though I say this, and even though you're all rolling your eyes, it'll still happen. And it, and it really sucks. But anyway, you're just selling yourself short. OK, any questions before I get into the lecture part of today? Yep? So in the exam, so there is like the encoding part or it's going to be? Any coding on the exam, it's all on paper. So it will be pseudocode, okay. right? So I'll say, write the A star algorithm. And then you will just write down whatever I had on that slide. Yeah. Or it'll be, you know, what are the time complexity properties of this algorithm? And if you, can, if you have a photographic memory, you'll get 100% in this course. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, you said we can check our assignments, the first and second one. Like, check you'll them? know if we get a 100 before submitting. Not 100. You'll know if you get like 80 or 90. Because there are, in, in my classes, there's always like 5 or 10% for like code style and following the same like formatting and stuff like that of the assignment. Because this is something that you're going to have to do eventually. You're going to go to a company, and they're going to say, hey, our code should be written in like this format with these conventions. So I just have a couple of small conventions to keep your code looking like my code. And it, it had, there's reasons for it. It's not just random. right? So, but for assignment one and two, you'll hit run tests. And if it's all green, you've got at least an 80, 85 on the assignment. But it's not the same for the other assignments. The other ones, I have different tests. Right. And for the last one, there doesn't need to be one because there will literally be arrows pointing to the solution if you did it right. Yeah. So the reason I'm using HTML and JavaScript in this course is because it's not a low-level, like, super optimization type course. I would do it in C++ if that was the case. Um, I'm teaching the algorithms. And a big part of, of algorithm teaching, in my opinion, is visualization. And so what I'll give you, actually, I'll show you. Um, I have this online. This is what one of your assignments is going to look like. Um, so here is an environment in which I have, you can click and it'll find, you click a goal and a start and it'll find the path. And then you can uh, do things like, you can have like an animated search so it shows like the expansion of everything. And so like, this is what you get for the assignment, and then you have to write just the algorithm in one of the files. And it's commented there, so you'll know what to do. So you'll get like five files. You don't need to know how any of the user interface works. That's all magic to you. Unless you want to look at it, you're, you're completely free to look at it. But you'll just be writing the, the algorithm, right? So some of them will be pretty easy. Oh yeah, like look, that, that's, that's obviously the, the correct solution. Um, other ones will have tests and um, you can like speed it up and slow it down and choose different algorithms and stuff. So the reason for using this technology is because programming languages are just tools. You choose the right one for the job and the right one for very easy, portable, easy to use user interfaces is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, in my opinion. Yep? Um, you mentioned that like we're going to get up the updated version of the solution. Um, what would that look like here? It'll, it'll, it'll be a .js file that you can't read with the human eye. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I might be able to show it to you. Yeah, this is what it looks like. Um, so it's like a megabyte of that. Just all the characters of the code have been translated to random ASCII strings. And like, it's potentially reverse engineerable because JavaScript does have to figure it out to, in order to run it. But like, this is the code. Right? It's way easier to not mess with that and just do the assignment. So it does the solution, but it's not meant for you to, to look at. I mean, look at it if you want. Just don't try to reverse engineer it, because it, won't, it, it will actually end up hurting you. If you've seen my solution, you'll try to do it in a way that it was not taught. And that, that'll be very obvious to me. OK, any other things before lecture? Great. I, the course usually runs really smoothly. The exams are pretty fair. If you've looked at the slides, you'll know it all. Watch the lectures. Keep up to date. You'll be fine. Alrighty.
Normally, the way I lecture, again, is to look at the slide, but I'm on such a sharp angle here, this is so weird. I feel weird just like looking at my, looking at my computer doing it, but I, I can't see most of that, so. Um, just a quick note, uh, uh, I've already said all this stuff. I'll, I'm skipping over what I have already said. Uh, I've already talked about the programming language. Okay, what is AI? It's a hard question. Many philosophers have written many books and many computer science PhDs have cried in their offices trying to answer this question. But I'm gonna give you a definition that I think is most toward becoming what it really is, or at least what I think of it. Um, I will not ask you that question on an exam. <laughs> Let's just say that. So what is, first, what is intelligence? Um, well, the way people have, some people have described intelligence is like some capacity for learning, reasoning, understanding, problem solving. Like a rock, nobody would say a rock is intelligent. Some people might say a computer is intelligent. Some people might say students are intelligent, right? So like there's some level of intelligence going on somewhere, some romantic human notion of intelligence where we associate making decisions and stuff with intelligence. Artificial intelligence would be building a program or a system or a machine that is not inherently alive Right? Whether or not you think an AI system is alive is another question, but something that has been constructed, usually from like silicon, it could be a mechanical computer that doesn't use electricity, but some sort of machine that appears intelligent to the user in some domain. And that some domain thing is important because there's this notion of strong or general AI that you know Google and DeepMind and these guys are, or and uh, OpenAI are trying to get, which is like a system that's good at everything. And as of right now, um, and I've, I've been saying this for like a decade now, the only systems that are good at really multiple things are kind of Swiss Army knife type solutions, where you have one solution over here, one solution over there, one solution over there. That being said, some things like reinforcement learning have been shown to like be able to be good at multiple games. So like the same algorithm can be good at chess or checkers or Go, for example. But still, there's nothing that even comes close to what I would define as like a strong or general AI or the singularity or Skynet or anything like that. We're still pretty safe. So AI uh, is a term that was coined by John McCarthy, um, who's one of the sort of the grandfathers of, of computer science. Uh, he developed Lisp. Has anyone ever used Lisp? Oh, you poor thing. Okay. Um, so McCarthy won a Turing Award for, for all of his advanced and he said, it is the science and engineering of making intelligent machines, especially intelligent computer programs. It is related to the similar task of using computers to understand human intelligence, but AI does not have to confine itself to methods that are biologically observable. That is very important, right? So some people might say any robot that walks around is AI. Well, there may literally be nothing controlling that robot. Like, it just might be just going forward, you know, apply voltage, wheels spin. There might be a robot that's intelligent, but how, so how you define AI is weird, you know? Like, an if statement could be AI. If you go to the game industry and they want you to program an AI for their game, you know, like playing World of Warcraft or something, and it's like, if they attack me, then chase them. That's AI, but it's an if statement. Right? So it's all about the domain that it gets applied to, really. Um, you wouldn't call necessarily an if statement like an academic researched form of AI, but it certainly makes a decision. And so I think that AI is, is kind of a poor term. Um, I, I think it should be called machine intelligence for whatever definition a machine is, right? So it's doing something intelligent in a specific domain or possibly in multiple domains and it is not inherently biological. That's, that's like a decent definition. So AI is the science of making computers do things that require intelligence when done by humans. Just all these different sorts of ways of looking at it without giving you, like, this is the answer, because there is no the answer. So AI has a number of different fields. Um, you can sort of break down AI research, at least academically, in one of two ways. One of the ways you can break it down is by the type of algorithm being used. So for example, heuristic search, genetic algorithm, machine learning, 
deep neural net reinforcement learning. Another way to break it down is the type of domain that you're trying to solve problems in, right? So I'm in robotics, I'm in video games, I'm in natural language processing, etc. And some algorithms are applicable in multiple domains. Some domains use algorithms from different, like multiple algorithms. So this is just a, like a one quarter of one branch of one of the trees of AI, but there's lots of different historical ways of looking at it. So for example, we have machine learning, which has become very, very, very popular. So we'd have supervised learning, unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning in there. Uh, natural language processing is a big domain of AI that can use algorithms from, from anywhere in AI. Uh, speech to text, text to speech. Um, we used to ha use these things called expert systems, which are sort of logic-based AI systems. Uh, planning, scheduling, and optimization. This is what like the first half of the course or a bit of the, the first part of the course is gonna be about. Algorithms for like, how do you solve a maze? How do you most efficiently plan this route? That's sort of where search comes in, is in planning and scheduling. Then there's so many topics in robotics. Robotics goes all the way from, um, I know the path that I want to take. How do I apply the voltages to the wheels to take me there? To, I have a humanoid robot. I don't want it to fall over. To, I, I want my robot to shoot down the enemy, but not the friendly people. All sorts of crazy stuff going on in robotics. And as part of robotics, at least more so nowadays, is computer vision as a problem. So image recognition, um, machine vision, all sorts of things. And there's another 50 of these that I could go on with. But AI, like what is AI? Every company in the world now, my convenience store is probably advertising themselves as using AI to like sell chips and Pepsi, right? So AI is such a huge term, it's hard to boil it down. Just you know, there are some things that are definitely more academic forms of AI, but anything that makes a decision could be in some world classified as AI. Who knows who this person is? Alan Turing. Alan Turing, there you go, perfect. So if you didn't know who that was, and you got to third year, oh. anyway. So Alan Turing um, was a genius, like a, a true genius in humankind. Um, unfortunately, he was persecuted by the British government for being gay and like chemically castrated and killed himself. It was truly horrendous, super genius. We would be light years ahead of where we are now if that didn't happen. So like prejudice is shitty. Um, wrote a lot of the seminal papers on computer science and thought a lot about um, artificial intelligence. And so in this paper uh, called Computing Machinery and Intelligence, I mean, look at when he died. This is when he was thinking about AI, right? So like Google did not invent AI, despite what they'll have you believe. So Alan Turing said that the definitions of machine and think are very difficult, right? What does thinking even mean? Is a, is a machine thinking? Is a person thinking? Is a rabbit thinking? Is a rock thinking? Like it's, it's hard to come up with that. And so the original question of like what is AI or can machines think, I believe to be too meaningless to deserve discussion. That, that was his view on it. Now, I'm not of that extreme of belief. It's cool to talk about, I think, but uh, he posed the question as a game, which was called the imitation game. And so in the imitation game, you have a computer, A, and a human, B, and you have a human interrogator, C. And the question is, can the interrogator determine which is the human and which is the computer? So this is, what's, what type of test is this? The Turing test. So the, he, he posed it as the imitation game. He wasn't gonna call it the Turing test, like I'm not gonna call something the Churchill test, right? But it, it since became the Turing test, which is basically, now he was talking about text, typing text, getting responses back. And so this was basically, um, you know, if you can't differentiate between a computer and a human in some domain, then it has effectively passed this test. So it may as well be thought of as thinking, right? Or intelligent or whatever. Um, ChatGPT, you know, is probably closer to, to passing the Turing test than any other system that I've seen. However, it's really bad at some things, particularly math for some reason. Like, it told me the sign of zero was one. Like, just weird stuff 
like that. It doesn't even have a built-in calculator. Anyway, so the Turing test um, is the standard interpretation of the imitation game, and it's can computers exhibit behavior which is indistinguishable from humans in some domain. And there have been versions of this asked for centuries. So it is the Turing test, but it's been asked for a long time. So Descartes, anyone heard of Descartes before? So basically the founder of what we would call the modern scientific method, um, talking about automata. So believe it or not, if, if just go home on YouTube and look up mechanical automata. So there are like machines that can do handwriting all with like gears and like a hand crank. It's, it's insane, there's no electricity whatsoever. So like since the 1600s, possibly even before, there have been, there's been automation. Uh, Diderot was a philosopher who talked about, you know, if a parrot can speak, is the parrot thinking? Is it just mimicking somehow? Does it actually understand? Like there's this thing on Reddit I saw recently where this parrot could like answer like a thousand different questions and tell people apart and like, you know, differentiate between surface, like, um, different materials and, and stuff like that. So are, are they intelligent? Um, and then Ayer talked about consciousness of machines. There is so much philosophy on this that is all very, very interesting. Um, but the one that I like to talk about, because I think it's, it blew my mind the most, is this thing called the Chinese room. It has nothing to do with Chinese. This is just like the Chinese language. It just happens to be that this guy Searle, who came up with the, ex the thought experiment, called it the Chinese room. So. Um, here we have me and, and the leader over here, and we want to talk, right? And so what this room is is essentially a black box. Nobody on the outside knows what's going on on the inside. And so whoever speaks language A is passing in symbols in their language into the black box, and whoever's on the other side is receiving translated symbols, right? So in here somewhere, there's a translation going on. And what Searle said is that inside the box, what's actually going on is that somebody has a giant book. And this magic book is um, it's big enough to hold all possible translations. So they could just look it up, right? So they get a symbol in, or a word, or a sentence, or whatever it is, and they're able to look it up and then just pass this on to the next person. So that, that was it. And the question was, is whatever's going on inside the box Intelligent. Is it intelligence? Let's close this. So, quick show of hands. Who thinks what's going on inside the box is intelligence? There's no wrong answer. Who, who would think that is intelligence in some way? Okay? Few people. Maybe there's some abstentions. I'll take the hands down as saying not intelligent. Well, to me, intuitively, I would say it's probably not intelligence because there's no like reasoning or there's no function being processed. It's just a lookup table, right? So now I ask you, what's the difference between this and a computer? Nothing. You're typing in code, it looks up what's to, what to do, and it sends the electricity in that way, right? So, by looking up and performing translation, the person appears to know the language and appears intelligent, but that person doesn't need to know anything. They're just looking up symbols. And so Searle said, this is exactly what computers do. They take in input, they follow rules, and they output some output, right? So there is no understanding of the semantics by the computer itself. So the Turing test even if it does pass, Searle's argument was that intelligence requires more understanding of semantics or something like that rather than just the outcome. So two very smart people, much smarter than me, are saying completely different things on the topic, right? So it's hard to come up with a single answer, but it's interesting, like, just the philosophy of AI. And there actually is a philosophy of AI course being offered this term for the first time, I think, in the philosophy department. Um, which would be fascinating to take. Any questions about anything? So yeah, this isn't so much exam stuff as it is just like, I find it really fascinating. It's a good introduction. So 
what I like to do is, is instead of telling people what a definition of AI is, rather give them some examples of what AI does. And then that's a, that's a thing. So planning and scheduling. Every single person in here, unless you're some sort of genius, has used some form of mapping software, right? I, I have used a physical map in my life, and it was not fun. Um, as soon as I got Google Maps, I just never went back, right? Actually, before Google Maps, I used, anyone use MapQuest ever? Oh, man, it was a website where you could, like, look up. You, so you put in your destination and where you are, and it would like produce a Google Maps-like thing that you could print, but there was no app, and it didn't follow you around with GPS. It was just like, it would like made the map as small as possible, so if I wanted to go from here to the mall, like it would print out Prince Philip Drive and just like square it up nicely, but anyway. Oh God, it's crazy. I, I, like, I don't know how to navigate in St. John's anymore, and I used to, I just like, it made me forget. But anyway, the algorithms we'll be doing in assignment two is basically the algorithm that Google uses um, for Google Maps. Uh, it's just applied to a much bigger data set. There are the uh, autonomous control problems in AI. So I mean, self-driving cars already exist, um, not quite as far as, as Musk would have you believe, um, but for some cases, they work well for like short duration uh, taxis, especially on like campuses and stuff like this. Uh, there are lots of places where you can call self-driving taxis to take you to another place. Um, they are on the road. I'm sure you've all seen the videos of people like asleep behind the wheel um, with a Tesla driving or something like that. And the cool thing about this is that AI doesn't have to be perfect at driving a car. It just has to be better than humans on average. And I think the thing that will stop full self-driving cars from taking over the whole universe is, well, A, some people actually enjoy driving, right? So they wouldn't give it up. But I think that the legal aspect of this is terrifying, right? You've all seen that thought experiment where it's like, okay, the train is going down the tracks and it's headed towards grandma. Do you pull the lever and have it hit a thief instead, right? And that's what this is doing, like, a hundred times a second, is what do I hit? <laughs> if it sees grandma and two babies, what's the equation, right? And the neural net is just a bunch of weights. It's just a bunch of numbers. It can't say, well, we chose to hit the pregnant woman instead of the four criminals because the life expectancy, blah, 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 there's none of that. Right? So like, that's what I really think. It'll just be society and human feelings that hold back self-driving care. <clears throat> Image and pattern recognition. Um, so a, a pretty cool story is that, so whenever you send a letter anywhere, so I'm gonna use the United States because that's the data that I know. Um, in the US, up to about the late 80s, there were at least two centers in every state, so all 50 states, there were at least like 200 of these places where your letter went to, to know where it's supposed to go. Like I write down my address, right? It has to be scanned by something, either a human or a machine. In the 70s, machines started scanning envelopes and they could do a lot of them. Right? They could get most of the addresses right through optical character recognition. Um, and so what these centers were for was to take the letters that couldn't be automatically recognized and then a human would look at it and send it on its way. Right? So there were hundreds of those buildings with dozens of people working in each of them. And now there are two because optical character recognition has just gotten to the point where it's just like really good. And so there's very, very few, maybe they haven't seen my handwriting, but like there's very, very few where um, they actually need to go to a human. Um, face re facial recognition technology, obviously you've probably used an iPhone that can face unlock or, I think facial recognition technology is one of the worst things humanity has ever done. And beyond slight conveniences of not having to type in a password, it has been used from, like, I think last year, someone who went to a theater was arrested 
like a lawyer who like said something about a politician somewhere, like police came and arrested them because the facial recognition technology found out who they were. And it's just like, what good can come from this? Like, I, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but it's just like being able to identify anyone at any time can only be used for evil, in my opinion. Maybe it could be used to locate a missing person, but like, but it's all over the place. Healthcare. Um, for years, like decades now, machine learning has already been better than doctors at diagnosing conditions. So if you give, like, here's what a doctor does. They use their years of knowledge and experience to translate a list of symptoms into a diagnosis. That's all they do. I've seen that before. I've seen that before. So they're just a database, <laughs> right? So what you do is you take everybody who's ever been sick ever with what they ended up having, and then you machine learn from their symptoms, their age, their sex, their nationality, whatever, to whatever they have. And computers, way better, way better. But the problem is nobody trusts computers, especially older people, right? So if you go in and a computer goes, beep, boop, you have cancer, I think I'd like a second opinion. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Well, that's, that's part of the thing, right? Like, you see over here, like, robotic surgery. Surgeons are humans that get tired. They make mistakes. Doctors who are, who are diagnosing people get tired or frustrated, or maybe they're pressured by drug companies and all kinds of stuff, right? Just take this drug, or, or there's nothing wrong, go home. Because they've seen 12 people that day that were all lying, and so you must be lying too. Like, all sorts of human biases. What has been happening more, which I really like, is that the computer systems are being used as recommendation systems for doctors, right? So the computer will, they'll type it in, the computer will say 90% this, 80% that, and the doctor will say, okay, maybe the doctor has another piece of information. Like, it can't be, okay, it's 90% it's that, but the, maybe the, they forgot to type in that they, oh, they don't have legs, so it can't be leg cancer, right? You know, something like that. So there's like a secondary step of the doctor looking at it. Something else um, is, is this here, where it's like semantic segmentation of brain tumors. So something that's really important in the medical field, especially for tumors, is tracking their growth over time. Like if you have a tumor and for 10 years it never gets bigger, you're probably okay. Okay, I'm not a doctor, do not consider this medical advice. <laughs> what I'm pretty sure of is that if it's not getting bigger, that's better than it getting bigger. And how fast it's getting bigger is very important. So hospitals um, employ, they like outsource to like these huge firms of people. Here's a, a thousand images, circle the tumor in this image, and then calculate the area of what you've circled, and that's how we know if it's getting bigger or not. This is something that computers for like a decade now have also been better than at humans. And so like this kind of stuff is important, right? It's better, it's more accurate, it doesn't get tired, it doesn't try and cheat to, to save a dollar here and there, it doesn't go to lunch. Like some things that can be automated are great. Now still, I'd probably want a second, you know, a doctor looking at it just to make sure that it got it right. And I didn't have like, you know, a crayon in my brain or something like that. But all right, robotics, we all know robotics, there's lots of different types of robotics. Um, one type is called swarm robotics, where you have a bunch of dumb robots doing things together that result in intelligent behavior. And then you have like one single really smart robot and like Boston Dynamics just pissing off Skynet for some reason like all the time. Like this is the, this is the video they'll play when they enslave us all, you know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's crazy how far robotics has come and I'm, I'm sure you've all seen um, different things. Robots can compose music. This is a band called Eraserhead, I think. No, not Eraserhead, something head. 
compressor head, compressor head. They're a robotic band who plays pre, pre, um, pre-written music, so they like guitar, drums, and everything. But uh, AI musical composition has gotten to the point now where um, like classical music, they, they take like people, normal people, and say, was this written by an AI or a human? And they can't tell the difference with any statistical accuracy. So like music is being composed by uh, students. Of course, there's art. Um, this is like Google's deep dream, um, where it's like creates infinite um, images. This is called style transfer, where you take a video, you take a painting, it'll apply that, um, that style to the painting. I'm sure you've all seen um, all these image generation things. So as I have pets, I have cats and ferrets as pets. So I typed in an oil painting of a ferret in a wedding dress getting married to a black and white cat in a tuxedo standing near a lake. That's insane. Like, I'd put that on my wall, right? Like, it's just, you can just do it. Like, anyway, we won't be learning how to do that in the course, but AI has come a long way even since I've started teaching this course. Yep? So my understanding is when an AI creates art, it's more of a mix of multiple different pieces. So when an AI writes music, is it writing multiple notes that are played by, like, maybe the author, or is it just manipulating sound? So both, um, it is writing notes, and in some cases, it is going raw sound, so like actual wavelengths. I'm not an expert in that field, so I'll say there are great YouTube videos on it um, that I've seen, but yeah, it's, it's both. So I've, there was, I go to this conference every year, which is AI and Interactive Digital Entertainment. It used to have a sister conference that was entirely devoted to AI music generation. So like an entire conference, and I'm sure it's not the only one. And so like it's a very mature field where people have spent lots of time, and they, and they do both. Yep. Um, a ferret holding a magic wand and casting a spell by the ocean. It's pretty good. Um, Top-down view of a new dungeon map for an RPG game. How crazy is this for game dev? I'm sure they're doing it everywhere. Um, I will still say that the best thing that AI like this and ChatGPT is good for is brainstorming. You can go into ChatGPT and say, hey, I'm forming a business, give me 20 possible names or 20 possible marketing strategies or 20 ideas for YouTube videos. And it'll just list them all in a second and then you can brainstorm off of them. And it's, it's a really, really good thing. Um, AI, not like this, not image generation, but uh, procedural content generation is a big thing as well in AI. So if you've ever played a game like Spelunky or No Man's Sky, these games that have like infinite content, um, they are procedurally generating that content as you play. I guess Minecraft being the, the biggest example. Minecraft technically not infinite, but effectively infinite. Um, language processing, has anyone ever done this with their phone? It's insane, it works so well. Sometimes it, it creates some hilarious results. But I went to Japan and like did this. This is not me doing it. But hey, there's a sign. Is that my hotel? Take a picture and it just translates it. You don't even need to take a picture. It does it in real time. Um, and obviously, take over the world, right? That's what everyone is scared of. Um, but something else is game playing. So when I made this slide, humans were still the best at Go. But now, I don't know, if it, has anyone ever played Go? Are you familiar with the board game of Go? A couple of people. Um, so it's an Eastern Asian version of chess, kind of, if you want to look at it that way. You place uh, pieces on a stone, uh, uh, stones on a board, it's a grid, and if you surround other pieces, you capture them, and the point is to have the most pieces at the end. It's an incredibly complex game. Um, arguably, for humans, it's harder to play well than chess. Um, for computers, it's way harder to play well than chess. Um, so just for example, uh, uh, chess, the world's best human was beaten in 1997 by a computer. So computers have been better at chess than humans since the 90s, but this only happened in 2016. So like, yeah. Go ahead. Do you know the, the AI that beat the Grandmaster Go player can actually be beaten by using really stupid strategies? The original version can. The self-taught Alpha Zero, I don't think it can. We'll, we'll go into that a bit later, but yes, 
one of the downsides of machine learning is in order to learn about something, you have to have experienced that something. So the phenomenon you're mentioning is that like there are systems, and there's do well-documented examples of this, where they were trained on expert human data, and then they could beat expert humans, but if some idiot like me comes along and puts all the stones in the side of the board, it has no idea what to do, because it's never seen it before. But one cool trade-off is that search, search algorithms, don't fall prey to that. Search will destroy the bad players. So we, we'll get into all that and why it happens. And StarCraft uh, Alpha Star by, by Google DeepMind has um, beaten some professionals, but is still not the world champion. So at least we have video games left. So how do we make new AI? Um, that's an interesting question. So AI research and development. Um, oh, I, I will say that one of the reasons that games are used in AI is because measuring intelligence is hard. How do you know that something is more intelligent than something else? It's like an impossible question to ask. And so what they did was they say, OK, these games in some way, shape, or form measure intelligence, right? Because you have to make, there's hard decisions to be made in these games. But games have defined outcomes, win, lose, or draw. And so if I make an algorithm that beats the old algorithm, it's at least more intelligent at go than the old algorithm. So it's a way of measuring the intelligence of new systems. So like my job as a researcher, you know, the other half of my job when I'm not teaching is developing new AI. So how does that happen? Well, first, you identify some sort of problem or area to work in. So for example, when I was just starting my, I, I went to the University of Alberta to do my PhD in robotics. And I took an AI class with a professor and I fell in love with it, and at the end of that class, the professor said, if anyone wants to work on StarCraft AI, let me know. And I dropped everything that I had done for that whole year and just switched, because I knew that if I didn't, I would regret it for like the rest of my life. And so that, like, that, was, like, that was the year that StarCraft AI like, basically started, right? And so somehow, you identify a problem to work with. It could fall into your lap like it did with me. You could go watch a bunch of videos, read a bunch of papers. Uh, typically what happens is you read a bunch of papers and something you're interested in, you read all the way up to what's been done, and then you do something new, right? You get ideas from that. So you review the literature of existing techniques. Oh, hey, I'd like to write the next world's best pathfinding algorithm, right? You may think that way after assignment two. So what are you gonna do? Well, the first thing you better do is read what other people have done because if you've thought of it, it's probably already been done. So then you go read all the stuff that's been done in pathfinding, and you say, oh, there's one case where they haven't been able to do this. I'm going to work on that. Or somehow you're sitting at home on the toilet, and you get an idea for a new algorithm. It happens sometimes. Um, or the shower or whatever. Then you develop some new techniques, right? That's like the magic step. And then you test the new techniques against the current state of the art. That's what this is under some specific controlled circumstances. So I played uh, 1,000 games of Go on a 19 by 19 board with zero handicap against this human, and I won 73% of the time. And you apply the new technique to the problem, and if that's better than the old thing, then good for you. You get a publication and some notoriety and maybe more students or whatever. So how do we test it? new AI? Oops, I forgot I had slides on this. We play games. Um, games measure intelligence. Um, and in my opinion, everything is a game. Not just like Settlers of Catan or Baldur's Gate 3 or StarCraft, but like relationships, life, your job, everything. Everything is a game. Some games just have more serious outcomes. What is a game? You are an agent in an environment, right? I'm playing chess, or maybe I'm down here in this Atari game, or maybe I'm going in for some treatment at the hospital. An agent can take actions, and those actions affect the environment. The agent has a goal. Might be defeat the opponent, move to the right, solve the puzzle, get the most points. It's maximizing some function, right? It's very difficult, if not impossible, 
to have an AI where you're not maximizing a function. Get the most points, get the most wins, most correctly identify the tumors. There's some function that you're maximizing. In a relationship, you might be saying, I, I want to be outdoors having fun the most, or sorry, in life. In a relationship, I want to have the, the most loving partner of all time, right? It's, it really is a game. And like you can take actions, those actions have outcomes, those outcomes are measurable, and then you try to, the next time you encounter something, you try and do it a little bit better. Uh, and we'll actually get into a little bit of this like philosophical, philosophical human decision making when we get to the game, th game theory section. So AI and games, uh, games can simulate the real world, and the idea is if our techniques in these complicated games are good, right, if the outcomes are good there, maybe we could translate that to the real world. So if my StarCraft AI works well, maybe I could translate that to robotics or surgery or whatever. Um, as a researcher, you have to worry about like ethics considerations, right? If I want to test on humans, I am doing paperwork for years. If I want you to take some pill or something to measure something, games, no problem. You can like, you can kill all the Goombas that you want in Mario. It doesn't, you don't need ethics requirements for that. They're pretty cheap, right? Creating a video or using a video game in a simulator, really, really cheap. You go out and you buy a robot, it might be a million dollars. Um, they're easy to visualize, they're intuitive, they're fun to program and play, and they help motivate people to learn. So human versus machine has been this sort of benchmark for AI systems over the years. Um, when I was in during, doing my PhD, this side of the board hadn't been solved yet. Um, so I, I'll just I'll go to the check marks. So in 1997, Deep Blue beat Garry Kasparov. That was the last day that a human was better than the best computer program. Um, checkers has been literally solved, meaning we know the perfect checkers move at any state of the game, the perfect move. Chess, we can play better than humans, but we, don't, we haven't proved that this is the best move. And I'll get into this later, but someone actually wrote a program that took like 15 years to run um, that was one of the people I knew at the University of Alberta. His name is Jonathan Schaefer, and enumerated checkers. So there's a big database somewhere that you can just look up the best move of checkers. Um, Go uh, is now way better than the world's best humans, especially with AlphaZero, and StarCraft is getting better and better all the time. I use StarCraft because that's where like, my field of research is. And you can just replace StarCraft with like, um, like group, Dota, League of Legends, these other games that have important strategical aspects. Uh, and also games are, they're just like, even if you don't end up going like, to do robotics afterwards, they're important. The video game industry is bigger than the movie and music industry combined. And it has been for like six or seven years. So it's also like just doing games AI is like an important industrial thing to do as well because you get better in-game AI, more intelligent NPCs. Who's ever done a follow mission in a video game?